Good morning, everyone. My name's David Prosser. I'm the festival's literary and editorial director. Uh, if this is your first experience of a forum event, uh, I just want to explain that the forum's a series of immersive and engaging events that run throughout our season. They're, they're intended to illuminate the themes and ideas in our playbill, to explore their resonance, their relevance in today's world. Now, this, the season theme this year is After the Victory, and today our panel will be looking at what that means in terms of various conflicts around the world today. First of all, just, just in accordance with a, uh, a practice that we've been following here recently at these events, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the original caretakers of the land that we are on. The Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe. Today's event is presented in partnership with the Monk School of uh, Global Affairs at the University of Toronto, and both that partnership and this event itself were proposed to us by the moderator of today's panel, Diana Horton, whom I'll introduce to you in a moment. We're thrilled to have this opportunity to collaborate with such a renowned center of academic excellence and public engagement, and we're equally excited to have a panel of such distinguished guests. So, a little bit of housekeeping. The discussion will last until about 11.30, uh, whereupon we'll have 15 or so minutes for questions from the House, and those should be written down on the slips that we gave you or that are available to you when you came in. We, uh, th those questions should be given to the ushers who will then deliver them to Donna on the stage, Deanna on the stage. Um, finally, since this event is being live streamed, I want to extend a special welcome to our virtual audience around the world. It's also being recorded by CBC, and it will be broadcast on ideas in the fall. Now, let me introduce you to our moderator, Deanna Horton. Deanna is a senior fellow at the Monk School and at the Asia Pacific Foundation. Before that, she had a distinguished career in the Foreign Service, including serving as Canada's ambassador to Vietnam. Most importantly, however, and those are the specific words she gave to me, so you can't accuse me of engaging in shameless civic or institutional boosterism. <laughs> She's a part-time Stratford resident and a supporter of the Stratford Festival through her membership in our Playwright Circle and Prospero Society, for which we thank her. We're proud to have Deanna with us today, and I will now call on her to introduce the members of our panel. Thank you very much, David. I'm going to do uh, introductions in alphabetical order. And let me just say that for each of these panelists, to introduce them properly would take up the full hour. So I'm going to be brief so that we can get right into the discussion. Hugh Siegel is master at Massey College, and his previous roles include that of senator serving in the Senate of Canada and as chief of staff to Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. He has been active in foreign and security policy for over 30 years and has a new book out called Two Freedoms, Canada's Global Future. Hugh's theatrical experience includes in the early 1990s <laughs> playing Gildan Krantz in a mock benefit fundraiser for Stratford at the Prince of Wales Theatre. The other performers were Bob Ray, Senator Michael Kirby, Hal Jackman and Jerry Kaplan. He tells me, though, that no theatrical agents called. <laughs> Hugh Siegel is also an honorary captain in the Navy and head of the Canadian Navy League, and as such, he is already looking forward to HMS Pinafore in Stratford next year. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Janice Stein is Beltsburg Professor of Conflict Management in the Department of Political Science and was the founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Many of you will recognize her from regular appearances on CBC The National and TVO The Agenda. Janice also taught at McGill University and Carleton University of International Affairs, and I said to her last night that although I did attend both of those, I never took her classes because they were too hard. 
Janice most recently received an honorary doctorate from the University of Western Ontario. Janice says that her most memorable play is Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman and cites in particular the statement, attention, attention must finally be paid, saying this still speaks today to the legitimate anger of those that we ignore that are invisible to us. Janice. And finally, Stephen Toop, who is the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at U of T, my boss, previously president of the University of British Columbia and dean of McGill University Law School and president of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. Stephen is a world-renowned expert on international law, but during his undergrad studies at Harvard, Stephen really wanted to be an actor. <laughs> and he actually appeared in a performance of Marat Saad as the director of the asylum. <laughs> and what does this say to you about his subsequent career? <laughs> Stephen, welcome. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I should mention that all three are Order of Canada recipients. So let's go to the first question. And I also another reminder that don't forget to get your questions ready. So let's start with Macbeth. The question posed by Macduff, O oh, nation miserable, with an untitled tyrant bloody sceptered, when, shall, when shalt thou see thy wholesome days again? This could relate to many countries today. Looking at countries led by leaders with blood on their hands, where do you see the role for Canada, the US, and other NATO allies? In the seemingly unending wars in the Middle East, we think now about Syria, but for example, but the civil war in Lebanon lasted 15 years. What are the prospects of this cycle being broken? Can it be done without redrawing the map? And in the war in Lebanon, and more recently the intervention in Syria, the premise for intervention has been to protect civilian populations. Canada is one of the architects of the international responsibility to protect policy, but is R2P still relevant today? Janice. Well, let me, let me take a, an early start at this, Deanna, and then hand over to my colleagues uh, so they can jump in. Uh, I think uh, we are at a unique moment um, in international history where the order in the Middle East is breaking down. It's beyond repair, uh, and the ripple effects of that breakdown in the order in the Middle East are flowing back into our own societies. So we can't think anymore in the ways that we have about responsibility to protect or discrete interventions. We have to understand that we are at the beginning of a very long cycle in which the existing institutions cannot be repaired Something new will be built. That something will be built, first of all, by the people living um, in that part of the world. And what we can do, frankly, is wash with horror at things that we cannot control. And that is very difficult for hubristic Westerners who believe that we can fix the world who bring our engineering and enlightenment mentality to the world and believe that we can fix it. That is not, we are not at that moment in history. We're in a very, very different place. I want to pick up on uh, Janice's point uh, about watching in horror because I, I agree entirely, but I think Janice would also agree that that doesn't mean doing nothing. Uh, it's extremely important, it seems to me, that. Canada, the United States, and other actors consciously try to contribute actively to the rebuilding of whatever this new order is going to look like. So it's not a question of retreating within Fortress North America, it seems to me. At the same time, it's not uh, acceptable to imagine that regime change all around the world is within our capacity. It simply isn't. But I think rebuilding institutions, figuring out what does the new kind of approach in the Security Council of the United Nations, for example, what does that look like? like 
that's a role that Canada, the United States, and allies, I think, have to play. So I don't <clears throat> agree with my few colleagues. I do think we have to have some very strong core commitments about what are the things that really matter in life. And if you see what is happening in the Middle East, you see the destruction of two freedoms, the ones that are the most important in the world, freedom from fear and freedom from want. And the collapse of both of those freedoms are being used by the forces of darkness, terrorists, juntas, and all the rest, to produce a level of chaos which says to people like us, there's no hope. There's nothing we can constructively do. We also, I think, have to take the view that when lines are drawn in the sand, they are not drawn because we think there's a moral equivalency between what terrorists may do in one part of the world and what might have happened in a war 30 years ago. There is no moral equivalency. The red line that our American friends established with respect to the use of chemical weapons was something they then deserted. A huge mistake, because what it said to um, Syria and various others, and in a soft way to Putin and others, is that actually we don't have to worry about the West anymore. There's no red line that's going to force them to engage. Hence, we can invade Crimea. Hence, we can do other things. So there has to be clarity. Churchill made the point, whenever you look away from an emerging disaster, because it's too painful, it's just going to get worse. So I think we have to have the commitment to engage. We have to have the ability to take some risks. We have to be respectful of the local culture and the local politics, as my colleagues suggest. But that doesn't mean we stand back when we see the kind of inhumanity being imposed on people and say, well, you know, it's really a lot messier than it was 40 years ago, so we have to disengage. I don't think that works. So, so what I, about responsibility to protect? I think responsibility to protect is something that speaks to our hearts but has no place in our minds anymore. I think that's finished. I would argue uh, there's different instrumentality. If all we mean by responsibility to protect is the capacity to deploy troops in a foreign no, country no. to make things happen, I agree 100% with Janice. But if you take a look at the endless battle between a difficulty between our Palestinian and our Israeli friends, look at the income structure in Gaza. The average family in Gaza earns one sixteenth of the average Israeli's minimum income across the border. There'd be a way to invest to bring that economic opportunity up, jobs for kids, where there'd be a rationale for people to sit down and try to find peace, but Canada should be looking at ways to do that and not just investing, as we do now, in the training of Palestinian police and Palestinian judiciary. So let me make it more difficult to you um, and make the challenge even bigger. Um, I actually think we don't know how to invest in other societies. If we look at the record of the instruments we've used, such as development assistance, in many cases, development assistance makes life worse and introduces greater inequities into the society, violates local traditions and local cultures, and destabilizes. So, so what I'm really saying here, we're the problem. We are part of the problem, not in the way that those who, who use terror and violence say we're part of the problem, but we're part of the problem because we say to ourselves, our values are universal. Our way of life is universal, and in the back of all of our heads is an insistent that we can export these ideas and values to the rest of the world. But would you not agree that the issue is about partnership, for example? What does that mean? Be, we, I'll tell you exactly what it means. It means that in, in Islamic countries, where development needs to be done, we should be finding a partner like the Aga Khan Foundation, which has stra standing and strength in those parts of the world, who already have a memorandum of agreement with Canada. He's already an honorary citizen of this country. There are ways to do it where we benefit from the local culture and roots but indicate that we're there, and we're not backing away from the challenge. Can I just pick up on the responsibility to protect? Because I think it's important to emphasize, as Hugh did, that from the beginning and right through to where we are now, the responsibility to protect was never Absolutely. meant to be about military intervention Absolutely. as a first option. It was always the last worst option. And I, I agree with Hugh, and I tried to indicate that we should not be simply stepping back and watching right. in horror. That's not good enough. But nor is it good enough to imagine, with the hubris that Janice mentioned, that we can reshape the world in our own image easily. And I think we have the experience of the disaster in Iraq that tells us that that is not an effective way of imagining the role of 
very well-meaning societies like our own that hope that we can have a benign influence in the world. I don't entirely agree with Janice that uh, we should give up on uh, overseas development assistance, for example. It seems to me, and I agree with Hugh here, that finding the right partners in the right places, understanding local culture as much as we possibly can, but saying, yes, we have a role, is where we want to position ourselves. It's somewhere in a, the usually uncomfortable middle that we have to find ourselves. So just a quick comment on that, and if we can, takes this discussion to a granular level, the Aga Khan Foundation uh, and it, the Aga Khan Development Network, which you both talked about, is, I think, simply the best in the world in terms of its performance. But why is it the best in the world? Because it invests for the long term. Correct. It works only with local partners. It doesn't work on a five-year cycle. Correct. It doesn't change its policies as we go through yet one more renewal and review of international development right. assistance. And both of you are smiling because you know I speak the truth. There is. <laughs> <laughs> so frankly, if we were serious and we were willing to engage in the kind of 25-year projects that the Aga Khan Foundation engages in, I might agree, but we're not. And we are but now we could be, Janice. There's nothing that actually prevents us yes, there from is. taking... Well, I, I think if we were actually going to be serious about this and learn from the experiences that we have seen in Afghanistan and in Iraq, then we would be saying we know that these are long-term changes that have to take place. We know that we have to work with local partners. I know election cycles make this difficult, yes. but they don't make it impossible if you've got good public policy. Well, well, yes, but that, the election cycles are what drives these. Every time there is a regime change in our country, the new government comes in, reviews what its predecessor did, tosses it in the garbage, and says, we're going to do it differently. And partners around the world who are on the ground, who are serious, who are committed, throw up their hands in despair at the disruption, and nothing has broken that. So it's, it's from that, when we actually look at our performance, it's easy to say this is what we should do, but we haven't done it for 40 years. Uh, this I, is not I a don't agree entirely conflict. that we haven't done it for 40 years. I actually think there was a stronger coalescence in foreign policy and overseas development assistance policies in the 1970s and 1980s. I actually think we've lost that. And the question is, how do we come back to it? The same phenomenon has taken place in the United States, where there was more of a bipartisan acceptance of certain key principles of foreign policy for a relatively long time post-World War II. We've lost it. So the question is not, is it ever possible, but how do we get back? But that bipartisan consensus was about ourselves and it was about Europe. It was about white Western cultures. That's where there was a bipartisan consensus that crossed party lines. There was never a consensus about how this white Western world was going to treat the In Western Canada, world. there was a consensus around policy related to Africa. There was a clear consensus on policy related to apartheid in South Africa. Yes. Again, we've lost that. But there was never a consensus on development assistance in Africa. And our record in Africa, even in those glory days of the 70s and the 80s in development assistance, was just as bad as everyone else's. So we need not to mythologize our own past. And, you know, we built roads that went nowhere. We did all the things. But Janice, we, we also did some good things. It's very easy, you, could, you say don't mythologize, but it's also important not to be unduly critical and to completely ignore where there have been successes. For example, in relation to the promotion and protection of women's rights historically, Canada played a very useful role internationally, and I think that was also a bipartisan well, approach. Well, let's talk about women for just one second before we leave this, Deanna. Women's rights is an issue near and dear to my heart. But you know, that's not a great conversation to have in some of the Muslim countries that we want as partners. There are deep value conflicts there. And when you walk into an Afghan village, which we did, and say, we are going to provide educational opportunities for girls. And the elders of the village say to you, well, we're not interested. If you're going to do that, not only are we not going to let you build your school, but you're not even going to be able to build a school for boys. And at the very most, you can put that, the girls' school way over here, 
Those are the kinds of hard value questions that our rhetoric doesn't deal with at a national level, and frankly, our policy pretends are just not there. I remember That's when, what's wrong I with I remember the when Flora MacDonald was the head of Care Canada after her time as a foreign minister, and she was Canada's first female foreign minister, and she was in Afghanistan, actually dealing with that issue of schools. She'd yeah. arrive in a village with, with a budget to build a school, and the elders would arrive, all males, and she said, no, I'd like to meet with the whole village to get the village's views to where the school should be, and the elders would say, we don't do that. She says, great, we'll take the money somewhere else. The next morning, the whole village came out. They had that discussion, and they built one big school with a girl's bathroom so everybody could go to school, respecting the separations necessary in the culture. And so at some point, you have to make a stand, because if you don't, it just gets worse. Okay, can we move on to uh, the next question, <laughs> which is uh, directed first at Hugh. So in a recent book, Mission Failure, America in the World and the Post-Cold War Era by Michael Mandelbaum, he writes, the military missions that the United States undertook succeeded. It was the political missions that followed, the efforts to transform the politics of the places where American arms prevailed that failed. In many of Shakespeare's history plays, the banished and vanquished rise again against the initial victors. And the type of war is being fought today, take Afghanistan for example, is victory going to continue to be increasingly elusive? And is victory defined as your enemy not being able to attack you on your own soil? So the general Machiavellian principle of national defense is you fight your battles as far away from home as possible so that your own civilian population is not victimized. That's a principle which I think will be around for a very long time. The difference between the old colonial powers, Spain, Netherlands, France, um, uh, the British, etc., was that when they went into a country, their purpose was to dominate it, to benefit financially from that ownership, to increase their geopolitical strength, and to stay. They knew how to stay. Our American friends who have fought many great battles on many great fronts, in some cases for the right causes, are often planning their exit before they get there. They don't have any plan to stay. They don't have any plan. They had no plan in Iraq. Whatever the success of the military exercise was, there was no plan, in fact, to re-engage the population to re-employ those parts of the military who had genuine capacity and standing in the community. By the way, there was no economic plan to produce a Marshall Plan for that part of the world so people had economic opportunity and jobs and a future that they could build their lives around. That's the kind of weakness, if you wish, that is producing the kinds of difficulties we have. I strongly recommend to Canadians and others here to see a movie called Hyena Road one of the finest films ever done about the hard, difficult realities of the Canadian engagement in Afghanistan. I have a member of my family who was deployed there three times and said that is the best that film done by Paul Gross. And remember Paul Gross was the person who was in that famous Canadian series called Due South about an RCMP officer, an FBI officer. And I'll always love him because the name of the dog was Diefenbaker, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> These days, if you're a Tory, you take joy anywhere you can find it. <laughs> but the core, the core and fundamental premise of that movie is that this stuff, just like Janice says, is very hard. Okay. Very culturally nuanced. All kinds of local uh, difficulties that will have existed long before you came and long after you go, but that doesn't mean you disengage. And I would argue that both in Libya and in Afghanistan, we were so busy on planning our exit that we didn't figure out how to have a continuing ongoing process. In Korea, there are still thousands of American troops there to help stabilize the circumstance. Look how long the Allies stayed in Europe after the horrors of World War II for good and substantial reason. We don't stop sending policemen into bad parts of town because those parts of town haven't turned around 100%. We send policemen into bad parts of town to keep bad circumstances from getting worse. That is a strategy of global deployment, which I think thoughtful countries should be engaged in. I want to pick up on uh, the question that you raise around whether or not uh, societies uh, really are most intent on avoiding 
uh, casualties within their own circumstances. And of course, Hugh's right that historically the answer to that is yes. Uh, I think we are though, as Janice said earlier, living in a really different world. And it is actually not going to be possible to prevent a terrible events from taking place within our own societies. With the best investments that we can make in security operations and in uh, spying, et cetera, et cetera, we are going to have uh, terrible events taking place. As we just saw in Nice, you know, a lone wolf uh, actor, it appears, can uh, wreak havoc uh, on a society. So the question for me then becomes, how do we generate social resilience? How do we not allow each and every one of those events to misshape our politics, to misshape our understanding of security so that we actually give up or potentially give up on some of the very things that we say that we're fighting for? This to me uh, has in fact happened since uh, the experience of September 11th, 2001. I think we've seen more and more intrusive state uh, apparatus allowed to operate in ways that is damaging to our society. So I'm not saying these are not important questions. They're tough questions. They require tremendous nuance. But I do think that this question of social resilience and how we can say to ourselves, we do have to accept and it's horrible, some level of damage and casualty and not allow ourselves to be bent out of who we are. Yeah, I agree with both. Um, I agree with Stephen that social resilience is going to be impaired in our society as we move forward. Um, Canada is no more exempt um, than France or the United States or Germany. Um, yes, we've done many things better at home frankly, than those societies have, and that's wonderful, but we have to be able to absorb attacks in our own society without overreacting and without um, distorting all the most basic values. Hugh, Hugh talked about the capacity to stay, which is really where we were in the first question, um, and I agree. It's, the question is, how do you stay? And the way you spoke about it, Hugh, was of course in a different period of history where it was conceivable that military forces would be deployed for generations and generations. We in this country had forces in Europe for decades after the end of World War II. The bigger question is, not only is this possible at home, because we're only having 1.8 children now. I don't know where the other 0.2 got lost, but <laughs> something happened. Um, and so we're much more reluctant to commit our children to the armed forces than we were even 20 years ago. And that's a, a developed society problem as a whole. And we're not going to send our kids to be deployed for 25 years, number one. So there's less willingness than there used to be. But number two, it's the presence of foreign military forces which turns societies and the, the presence of these forces become provocations after a certain period of time. So the willingness of other societies to have our boots on the ground is not comparable to what we knew from an earlier historical period. He told this wonderful story about Flora. I happened, so in this closest circle, I happened to have gone back to Afghanistan with Flora. We went to look for that school. It wasn't there. Right? And that's the issue we're dealing with. Why wasn't it there? When Canadian development assistance disappeared, as it always disappears, the elders closed this school because it was inconsistent with their own customs. And the funding for the teacher dried up. So you were left in an empty school building with no teachers and no girls in that school. So that's to me, so this story, it's interesting because it puts squarely on the, on the agenda, what does it mean really to work with partners? How far are we willing to compromise, to reflect the basic values of our partners so that what we do is sustainable in other people's societies who see the world differently? How long are we really willing to stay? We're in a review right now of development assistance policy. Are we prepared to commit for 25 years? Are we prepared to make one project grant one project grant for 25 years? No, we're not. And it violates Treasury Board guidelines. 
were we able to do it? So are we serious about staying and partnering? I don't think we are well, in I a deep that, way. If I may say so, that gets to the problem that you've talked about so eloquently, which is as follows. New government, new foreign policy priorities. Yeah. New minister, new foreign policy priorities. Another government, more foreign policy priorities. They all get laid on each other's on top of each other like a wedding cake, they all get crushed, and by the time you have a thousand micro priorities, all of which are underfunded and understaffed, yeah. which is why I make the case yeah. in the book you were kind enough to reference, Deanna, that we should be actually looking at the two freedoms that matter the most, freedom from fear and freedom from want, and look at our foreign policy and our development policy and our defense policy to see how are we achieving those goals in different ways, in different places, culturally sensitive, and we should have that point of measurement because if we don't do that, we're going to go down the road that Janice has referenced in perpetuity, and that is a waste of time and effort, and it doesn't actually achieve. The things we all agree on as Canadians are important for everybody's rights worldwide. Exactly. Can we move on to um, all my sons? Because I think what you've been saying is very relevant in the sense that this takes place shortly after World War II, and part of the theme is kind of the economic incentive for war. And when we're talking about not wanting to put boots on the ground and things like that, I mean, that is pushing us in the direction of where can we sit comfortably and wage war? Drones, cyber attacks, things like that. So how does, for example, if you think about this, how does Canada's decision, just to, to take one example, um, with, reg with respect to ISIS to withdraw from the air campaign and just and help out on the training side. How does, it, how does this look in that context? Well, remember it was, I guess it was Eisenhower who talked about the military industrial complex. Incredibly interesting when you think about it historically. I mean, here's a guy who was one of the greatest generals uh, of his era and president of the United States, a conservative. Uh, and was worried about the extent to which it's possible that uh, commercial interests can actually drive policy in the wrong direction. Uh, we have seen uh, examples of that historically. There, there, are, there are many. I, I, I don't think that it's as simple as we imagine to disengage ourselves from the moral consequences and even the uh, psychological consequences of... Um, forms of warfare that seem far away. Uh, there's a wonderful film, you mentioned Hyena Road, which I uh, support entirely, great film. Another very interesting film recently is called Eye in, in the, the Sky, Sky. Mm -hmm. British film, uh, which uh, talks about uh, drone warfare. Mm -hmm. I really encourage people to see it. It's very nuanced in showing that the folks who are sitting in the Nevada desert and actually firing uh, the drone uh, missiles uh, can actually experience the same kind of trauma as people who are on the ground. And that seems counterintuitive, but if you see the film, you'll realize why it's not. And I think as a society, we're going to have to be very careful that we don't imagine that just because things happen far away and drones are being used, etc., that there are no consequences psychologically for ourselves. So I do worry about that. I think uh, a country like Canada clearly has to make choices. We don't have high capacity militarily, and frankly, I think we have underinvested militarily over a long period of time, and that's a bipartisan comment. It applies both to conservative and to liberal governments, so that we find ourselves in a position that when we're asked to be part of important missions, we're simply not able to do so. I was not someone who was particularly in favor of sending the six uh, planes, uh, not because I thought we shouldn't be part of a mission. I just thought it was perhaps more symbolic than anything else. And that what we really should be struggling with as a society is how to make investments that allow us to contribute meaningfully. And I don't think we're close to that. The current discussion around uh, the fighter planes has uh, descended into entirely partisan and really unhelpful uh, pointing of fingers uh, that goes back historically. Hugh can comment on that. So I really uh, would 
challenge Canadians to take more seriously the role that we are asked to play in the world and figure out how we do that by making proper investments. You know, it's, it's, I agree, and I think we, all three of us would agree that we've underinvested in our military, and there is, again, a disconnect between the way we talk about ourselves in the world and actually the investments we're prepared to make. The expression in the West for that is big hat, no cattle. Yeah, big cat, no cattle, exactly. It's also interesting that where um, it appears we're going is re-engagement in Europe, in Latvia, right? Uh, and, and that's not to diminish the importance, but that's familiar ground. Uh, we know how to do that, and I think we know how to do that and do it well because we're operating within a cultural context in which we were very good at reading. Uh, unlike um, many of the parts of the world that, frankly, we're not as good at reading. It's interesting that Obama, to come to your, the issue of drones and distance warfare, it's interesting that Obama, the most cerebral, the most controlled president the United States has ever had and ever likely to have, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in my lifetime, let me put it to you that way, <laughs> Um, was is the drone president. Uh, um, and so that's worth thinking about just for a moment. Uh, he effectively pulled back most of American forces from Iraq, from Afghanistan, was unequivocal with his team that he would not commit military forces to Syria. And I am among those who believe that history will prove him right, um, that military forces, American military forces, in Syria would have exacerbated rather than resolved any of the deep, deep underlying conflicts that are tearing that society apart. But what was the solution then? It was precision warfare at a distance to take out known militants um, who intended to attack American personnel or the United States itself. Now, in that last sentence, lies years of jurisprudence, which Stephen is deeply familiar with. How do you know what constitutes intent? How many surrounding civilians can you kill when you use a drone? Is one child, one child too many if the child is with the known militant? How good is your intelligence? Those are all huge questions which we struggle with. And I think these are going to be the questions of the future as are, we are on the threshold, let me just leave you with this pleasant thought. We are on the threshold of yet one more radical revolution in military technology. And the, the lingo for this is autonomously controlled weapons. And what this really means is that the weapons will have the capacity to learn independent of the human being who programs them. So we will have missiles that will get an original series of instructions, and once they're launched, the controller will no longer have any control. The machines will learn by themselves, redirect themselves, and humans will stand back, having ceded control to new kinds of technology. This is just over the horizon. So much of the discussion that we're having ignores what I think is a fundamental change in the way human beings relate to the military weapons that they've created. Let me just deal with the issue of technology and, and stability in foreign policy. Ever since the days of the Cold War, we understood that we had to have superior technology on the West side so that the Russians, who may have been more than prepared to deploy thousands of troops over the German border without regard to human life, understood that the price was just too high. And it was that policy that produced over time, uh, under Reagan and Thatcher and others, the end of the Cold War without a shot being fired. So the capacity to have that technology in place is some of the best ways to actually avoid hostilities from breaking out. That being said, Ted Heath said of Pierre Trudeau, the father of our present Prime Minister with respect to NATO some years ago, Ted Heath said, Canada, all aid short of help. And I think what we have to keep in mind is that this new Prime Minister, to his credit, campaigned to remove the fighter jets as part of his open campaign. He sought a mandate, he got the mandate, and frankly, putting in more forces to help the Peshmerga, one of the few forces on the ground making progress against ISIS, is not tactically inconsiderate, I think it's thoughtful, so one has to keep a varied approach. But 
different technologies in the hands of the right sources is a way to control and diminish the will of some of the bad sources who don't care about loss of life. In fact, they prefer it because of their nihilistic view of their mission. Good point. Let's move on to As You Like It. <laughs> so in As You Like It, Duke Frederick, the usurper of power, finally meets a holy man and retreats to a monastery <laughs> rather than launching into battle. A victory over himself. Many people would have wished this outcome for Muammar Gaddafi or Bashar al-Assad. And there are many leaders today, other examples would be Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un, who seem to have difficulty overcoming their instinct to bully. And there are many leaders who just don't want to leave. So is this necessarily a bad thing? Do we all encourage the path to democracy? Is liberal democracy not the right fit for every country? And how best to deal with usurpers of power and in intransigent leaders other than war? Well, um, <laughs> Easy let, me question. let me say that the biggest risk we face with those kinds of folks is their absolute comfort with the notion of impunity. We saw that in Sri Lanka, which wasn't the worst offender worldwide, where the Rajapaksa regime was having, long after the Civil War was ended, Tamil civilians and journalists of all backgrounds, white van, disappeared, jailed for no reason, they, they impeached a, a chief justice of the Supreme Court because her court had the temerity to rule against the government on a constitutional matter. The absence of any risk of facing some kind of accountability is what produces a license in these areas. I think of Mugabe importing by the caseload champagne and caviar for an 80th birthday when the kids are starving in his country. No, no accountability. So the notion, as I've often heard Madam Justice Arbour say, very distinguished former prosecutor at The Hague and elsewhere, that you know, suggesting that everybody goes to The Hague is not a great way to open a negotiation with one of these leaders when you want to bring war to an end. That is a considerable and constructive constraint. That being said, if I think of a place like the Ivory Coast, where a genuine election was held, a real winner was chosen, certified by the internationals as having won, Effectively, Bagbo wouldn't stand down, surrounded the hotel where the internationals were with his artillery. In the end, the French acted, arrested Bagbo and his wife, and took him by helicopter to The Hague is actually a good outcome because it sends a message to others in that part of the world and elsewhere that there are consequences. You have to have some measure of balance. You can't apply the same cookie-cutter rule to every context. But leaving away, leaving, moving away from the notion that there are consequences will only encourage the bad people, the Kim Jong-uns and the others, to be substantially worse, and that is not in anybody's interest. I agree that uh, one wants to have uh, consequences to bad actions. Uh, I think the, the only thing I'd add to that is that there are such different circumstances mm -hmm. that you have to be extremely careful in your analysis. So Bagba, for example, is not at all in the same position as someone like Kim Jong-un. Uh, you know, you've got a country that has the potential to use a nuclear weapon. You also have a regime that is utterly insulated from international engagement, unlike the Cote d'Ivoire, for example. So what might work in one circumstance really won't work. I don't think there's very much we can do that will actually change the policy in the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea. I think there, the question is really about containment mm -hmm. rather than about change. Whereas in other circumstances, when there's really bad behavior, it may be possible. Sri Lanka is a great example. I used to do a lot of work there myself. And I think there has been a capacity to change because it's a country that's engaged with the rest of the world, that wants to trade, that wants to have uh, relations. And so I think in those circumstances, putting concrete pressure on can actually make a difference. So I think it's a, a subtle set of choices depending upon very particular circumstances. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think at the root here, and this is what makes this such a difficult conversation to have, um, there can be, and this is hard, there can be a conflict between peace and justice. Peace and justice, we want both. 
Um, but sometimes you have to offer people asylum and impunity in order to get them out so that you can avoid literally thousands and thousands of casualties. And that doesn't sit comfortably uh, because it's unjust, it's unfair, um, but it saves lives. And so there's a very difficult moral calculus that we have to make in each case, and each case is different, about what's appropriate. Uh, I think most of us would, one of our fervent wishes would be that Bashir al-Assad finds a magnificent dasha on the Black Sea <laughs> and lives out the rest of his life with every luxury. Uh, we would, I think every Syrian would accept that deal um, in order to avoid the consequences of an ongoing civil war. So, Actually, uh, Janice, I think the problem is not every Syrian would accept everyone. the deal. Yes, uh, you're right, but uh, many Syrians. Many, many would. The and, majority. And it, and it might be the right choice at the end of the day, but I think there will always be that remaining tension yes. and pressure. I don't think it goes away yes. once you've made a decision. And the inverse of that is, you know, trying to capture someone and bring them to The Hague or wherever else can sometimes exacerbate situations yes. and make it worse. That's and the conflict. that's the problem. That's the conflict right there. But just to pick up on one last point, which she raised, um, which I call the habit of accountability. Um, and I actually prefer that to liberal democracy. Um, what we're really, because liberal democracy is a product of a particular set of cultures and a particular time in history, and it's well suited. We have to work hard all the time to make sure that we safeguard it, but it's well suited. Um, it's not as easy a fit in different societies that place less value, for example, on the individual and a higher value on communities. Uh, so what we're, I think comes close to a universal perspective is people's desire to hold their government accountable with the instruments that they have. And there are many ways that we can assist in the conversation of thinking about um, new instruments, new institution, new ways of doing politics that allow people to hold their governments accountable. Well, you know, look at our own Aboriginal communities. They do it through elders meetings and elders councils. And so what then becomes very important is to reinforce what are habits of accountability in each society without necessarily coming at it from the perspective that we have for the last 150 years. Our way is the way of the future. That's what this sobering moment in history is about. It's not at all clear that our way is the way of the future. I would only add that I think for me, that's one way of understanding what people often refer to as the rule of law in a society. Yeah. Yeah. I actually think yeah. Janice's description of there being appropriate mechanisms of accountability Absolutely. where no one is aside from or above the law is, the, for me, the best way of thinking about the rule of law Absolutely. rather than institutions. And I only Absolutely. say that because it, it, it happens to be something that Canadians and Americans talk about a lot. And I think that linking it to the idea, the fundamental idea of accountability and fairness is the right way to go about it. We agree. So in the Aeneid, um, <laughs> this is a, an ancient story of a refugee seeking a better life after defeat in battle as this is a story that has been replicated a thousand times over. So displacements as a result of war are now at a high level. Europe in particular is struggling to deal with the influx. We hear the most about Syria, but let's not forget long festering wars such as in the Sudan. Should Canada be doing more to address the wars that give rise to the refugees? Yes. <laughs> If I can just, the, the, only, the only nuance I would bring to what is a, a really important question is that we often are thinking about Europe and imagining that it's Europe that's really struggling. But in fact, the real struggles are taking place 
nearer the borders sure. of the refugee producing countries. That's absolutely true. So I want us to be thinking about Jordan. I want us to be thinking about Turkey, especially today. Mm -hmm. uh, these are countries that are actually dealing with millions of refugees without the economic capacity that Western Europe has. And uh, I think it's in that sense, and that's why I'm so emphatic about this, I think that's where Canada really does have a role to play. Working with others, this is not something that country, any country can do on its own, but working with others to try to figure out how to provide better support so that children are not finding themselves being exploited in uh, Jordan or, or in Turkey, working uh, as they often now have to to support families, for example. So, so that's a, uh, I think it's a really interesting question, because uh, Diana's question was really, should we be doing something more about the wars? Um, and Stephen said, and I agree with him wholly, we should be doing something more about those countries that could be plunged into chaos if we don't help deal with the refugee population. So that's a little different. And but I, I think those are countries that are actually at risk of war. I that's agree. the connecting point. I agree with that entirely. I'm pessimistic that we could engage in any constructive way right now in Syria, to be frank. But I think there's myriad of constructive things. We, and so I wholly we, we could do in Jordan. Let me give you just one example, which if we were serious, and this is not partisan, because my view is that we haven't been serious for so long, I can't remember when we last were. Uh, you know, the Tari refugee camp is on the border between Syria and Jordan, has 100,000 Jordanians living in camp. Half the kids in that camp are not in school, which really means we're gonna lose a generation of kids, gonna grow up, especially the young men, and they're gonna be easy recruits to violence because they will not have skills, they will not have opportunities. The order of magnitude is not huge, it's 100,000 people. Now here's the fantasy. Our government says, we're actually gonna take on the Zatari refugee camp. What does take on mean? First of all, in partnership with the Jordanian government. Secondly, we're gonna make a commitment that we're gonna stay until the refugees in that camp are able to go home. Thirdly, we have very innovative young architects in this country that are thinking about housing in a very different way. Um, we have some of the best. What about partnering with our young architects in our own society and creating the kind of permanent housing in these camps which are not tent-based? We have, a few miles up the highway, a hub of young people working on digital education. What about partnering with our young people to deliver digital education to the Satari refugee camp for everybody in that camp because the orders of magnitude are there. We're a leader in healthcare delivery. We're a leader in infectious diseases. What about challenging our government and our society to put together the whole suite of instruments which would be necessary to turn life around for people living in the Satari refugee camp and to make that an open-ended commitment so that those people who, we do not betray the trust of those people who engage with us. And we already have this experience. The frustrating piece for me is that Canada's doing some of what Janice just said in the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya, where, where there are many Eritrean, Ethiopian, Sudanese refugees. Four Canadian universities are right. already working on education for uh, girls in particular who had right. no capacity to be educated before. Right. So we know how to do it, right. but often we just don't make the decision to be engaged over the long term. And to put together across the spectrum, housing, education, health, right? So that's a focused effort with results that we can see, that we can explain to the Canadian public, and we take on a piece that's commensurate with our own size and scope and resources in the world, then we're serious. I guess I would differ from Janice, not in her optimism or in the <laughs> suggestions for how we could be constructive because they're all, as always, solid and compelling. But I think we have to be honest with ourselves about consequences. The people in those refugee camps are there as a consequence of the world not having engaged with, um, with Bashar al-Assad. It's a consequence of having created a vacuum in which the Russians were more than delighted to engage, 
to protect Bashar al-Assad for their own geostrategic reasons. And we are now, and then, by the way, the Russians are not troubled by massive flows of immigrants into Western Europe in a way which produces divisive forces in that part of the world. I'm not suggesting you can roll back the tape. We are where we are, and the things being suggested by my colleagues are very compelling. But the lesson we have to draw from that is that when there are the Bashir al-Assads, for whom there are no red lines, if we don't engage, it just gets worse. I have to disagree violently. <laughs> The, reason, the, the problem in Syria is not due to the Russians. The problem in Syria... It's not where it started. You're right. The problem in Syria is 40 years of brutal dictatorship of a minority group, the Alawites, ruling majorities, right? And no legitimacy to a government which is afraid of its own population and therefore uses the most repressive instruments of force against its own population. That's the problem. And if you go to, and, and, and that's an important change in perspective, right? If you go to the Arab world and you listen to what remains, um, uh, you know, in, in, uh, educated um, Arabs who still are in the Arab Middle East and haven't fled or been persecuted or forced to flee, they, are, they, they look now at what's happened and they say, the problem is with us, with the institutions that we allowed to continue, with the failed system of governance. If you read the Arab Human Development Report, that was written by an Arab sociologist and economist who said, the flaws are within us. Whenever we say, it's the Russians, it's the Chinese, it's the Americans. That is actually a deflection from the real conversation. And if the conversation's real, the problem becomes not Bashir Assad. The problem becomes, how do we help our friends in the Arab world build habits of accountability to, to return well, to the conversation? And, and, and because if we argue, change one for the other, it's not going to matter. And I would argue that, however many ways we can be helpful, it is not helpful for them to know that when push comes to shove, we are nowhere to be found. But that's we shoved, exactly in, the we shoved that in Iraq. Over the red line. We shoved in Iraq. We shoved Saddam Hussein. And I would argue that, however controversial that may have been, not staying long enough is what produced the difficulty, not the fact that the decision was made to deal with that chap in a way that had well, to be addressed. It, but how long is long? Because we had to deal with him in the liberation of Kuwait yeah, when he invaded another country. But how what long if we had long? not engaged then? How long is long when you're dealing? With Didn't you say 25 years? I heard you say 25 years earlier. <laughs> well, I'm yeah. okay with that number. That's You're a number okay I'm with okay 25. with. Because again, what does Saddam Hussein do? He, the Sunnis are 20% of the Iraqi right. population. It's right. another example. The worst regimes in the, in the Middle East are minorities ruling majorities. That's going to tell you something. And that was part of the problem in Iraq. We yeah. continued to support, the U.S. continued to support the al-Maliki government, which was absolutely repressive and not reaching out at all to its, uh, its minority population. So, you know, the, the frustration in all of this is I don't, I don't violently disagree, but I think I partially disagree <laughs> because although I we do sometimes have to take action. We do sometimes have to stay the course, so to speak. We also have to get, get it right while we're staying the course. And I think in Iraq, not only did we support a regime that we shouldn't have, we also allowed massive corruption to be taking place, of which we actually became a part. And that can't be sending the right signals either. If you think about Bosnia-Herzegovina, where Canadian ah. troops were deployed for a very long time, along with NATO partners. Not a perfect outcome, but kids can go to school, moms can go shopping. People are not having their homes bombarded by the militia up in the hills because forces stayed long enough in a pacification and support exercise with local government. So there are good ways to do it, not perfect, and there are ways that aren't quite as successful as my colleagues have pointed out. But packing up before you get there so, you, so they know you're gonna leave, they know they can't build an ongoing relationship, strikes me as counterproductive. You know, wonderful that you brought up Kosovo because <laughs> the UN just issued a report two days ago which made absolutely astonishing reading. Um, the, the peacekeeping mission, that good word, peacekeeping, who can be opposed? The peacekeeping mission in Kosovo had a tribunal evaluate its accountability. Mm. And the report came back, abject failure. Just take this little piece, abject failure. 
to hold the peacekeepers accountable for the acts they committed. This tribunal tried not once, not twice, but multiple times. And again, the cultural context, there's not great gaps there, but we put in place under the UN, the most sanctified institution that we have, under the UN, a force which the population was subsequently unable to hold accountable in any meaningful way. Let me urge everybody to read that report because it is an education that none of us really want to have, but it's sobering. When, you know, when we think about, we didn't talk about this, but when we think about the record of UN peacekeepers, because this is now back on our agenda, it's frankly appalling. We have more peacekeepers deployed anywhere in the world than we've ever had in terms of numbers. We have UN peacekeepers that transmitted cholera in Haiti and will not take the responsibility for doing so because they will be liable. What kind of habit of accountability is that? We have UN peacekeepers that engaged in sex trafficking and rape. And we've repeatedly tried now for seven or eight years to bring some accountability to those forces. We're nowhere, frankly. <coughs> rape is a recognized war crime, but we're unable to hold these peacekeeping forces the accountable. Pro the problem is the we in that. Who is the we? In fact, the states that control the United Nations have not wanted it to be held accountable. That's the problem. We have an unaccountable institution, and let's right. talk about it that way. But so, I think the, the key for me, though, is we have to, we have to be clear that the real unac unaccountability is within the member states, because they control that institution. So let me ask the hard question. Would you say we commit peacekeeping forces under an international institution that we are not able to hold accountable? So I don't think that peacekeeping in the Lester B. Pearson notion has existed for a very long time. Of course. That's right. Because peacekeeping is based not. upon two sides that want observers in the middle to observe the peace. We haven't really had that since Suez and Cyprus, where Canadians were deployed for 30 years. Truth of the matter is, peacekeeping- Even more than 25. Yeah, indeed, yeah. more than 25, just to make the point. Stayed the course. That's right. Yeah. And But the bottom line is that um, now you have to have combat-capable forces to deploy in a fashion that stabilizes an area, sometimes by being able to engage themselves when attacked, which is what we did um, in the Madoc pocket in that part of the world and what Canadian forces have now been prepared to do because the rules of engagement have changed. What we're thinking about doing in Mali, right? And that's one of the options our government is currently considering. It would be exactly the kind of, uh, uh, of option that you described. But should we make as a condition that we will not deploy peacekeeping forces unless the UN reforms and holds accountable those contributors, troop contributors, whose forces behave in ways that violate the laws of war. Would that be something that Canada would really be prepared might, to do? It might mean we never have to deploy. It might mean that, but we would be serious then. Because that might get us back to the big hat, no cattle allegation. I would only say that if you're going to do that, you have to do it with your allies. You have yes, to do it collaboratively. Of and then it might actually have an impact. And right. I would say, yes, that would be a good thing to do. Well, Can I just jump in here? Because we do have a lot of very good questions. Course, and great. we won't be able to get to them all. But I'm trying to co um, put them together a little bit. Going to the UN, because there are, there are questions related to that, the role do we have common global values that the UN should be trying to work with countries, with its member countries to instill? What do we do in situations such as Zimbabwe and Sudan? I mean, you have this sense of um, looking, as you said, with horror as to what's going on, but social resilience, does that mean that we become so resilient that we don't want to get involved? And some of these drag on for years and come in and out of the public eye. And then there's less interest than what happens. And then going to the question of accountability, um, the, the recent Chilcot report, are Western leaders being held accountable? So there's a bunch of things there that if you wanted to jump in. I'll just say briefly, there are two UNs in my judgment. The one in which Canada should be, develop, should be investing heavily, UNHRC on refugees, UNICEF, all those agencies out there doing great work, 
to assist the human condition worldwide. I think the old Security Council function where it can be seen as a stopgap to keep bad things from happening is more of a prayer than a reality, and I think we have to be honest with ourselves about that. The, the Russians and the Chinese, who will sustain any dictatorship that's in their interest, cannot be trusted to vote in the global interest in those contexts. So my view is rather than fixate on a seat at the Security Council, we should be investing heavily in the other organizations that are on the ground doing great work in all of our name in support of humanity, development, economic, and education. I agree with a lot of what Hughes just said, uh, except that I don't think we can give up on the Security Council. And the reason I say that is because it is, for all of its flaws, and there are many, it's one of the only sources of legitimacy that exists collectively in international society. I don't actually believe we do all have entirely shared values. I think that's always been a prayer and, and, or a hope. Uh, and not a reality. I don't think there is such a thing as the international community that secretary generals love to talk about. I think there is, though, something that you might call international society that has to have places to get together to, to really struggle with hard questions. The vetoes are enormously problematic, but they've been equally problematic historically exercised by some of the Western powers, particularly by the United States. So this is not a question uh, that we can stand up and say, we're always on the right side, we've always been legitimate, we haven't. So I would, I would keep putting a little bit of emphasis on the Security Council, while at the same time agreeing entirely that there are some organizations internationally that actually do work and we should try very hard, and the High Commissioner for Refugees is one of them, to sustain them as much as we can. So the UN Security Council, if we just take one quick look at it, it's an unrepresentative institution, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have countries with veto powers, Britain and France, um, who cling to a veto and have excluded other countries that are by now far more powerful economically, politically, and militarily. But they rarely exercise their veto, to be fair. But they're nevertheless veto exercising powers mm -hmm. who are consistent in their objection to reforming the institution. So we have an unreformed, unrepresentative council, number one, which uh, doesn't even hold itself accountable uh, for what it does. So. Again, coming back to the 21st century, the United Nations played an enormous role and has played an enormous role at different points in this last century. It's very difficult for me to believe that as it's presently structured, it's a forward-looking institution that can meet any of the challenges we've talked about. The specialized agencies, as Hugh says, are very different. Um, UNHCR, the World Food Program, which is one of the few agencies in the world that goes into the most conflict-riven societies and manages to work with local partners to get food to people who are starving in conflict. And we're a funder of the World Food Program and we should continue to be. The World Health Organization, though, that's a little different, right? And we need to look at that. Why is it different? Because when Ebola broke out and the earliest intelligence arrived at WHO headquarters, and people understood, because it's a highly professionalized agency, understood what was at stake. The director refrained from issuing the global health emergency that was necessary. Why? Because African government representatives put enormous pressure on her because it would get in the way of tourism and would deprive these countries of high currency. We need to up the standards, even in the specialized agencies, and we need to be relentless in facing the challenges that these institutions Can um, I just uh, break in here because we're running out of time, but there's a couple of very interesting questions here as well that I wanted to get to. Um, Francis Fukuyama, The End of History, Samuel Huntington, The Rise of Fundamentalism and Tribalism. That's one thing. What is the connection? Stop, Stop Deanna. That's enough. That's big enough. Third world tribalism and Western population, what's the connection? And should we be willing to engage with or even help societies whose values are inimical to us? Fukuyama, to his credit, wrote subsequently mm -hmm. saying he was wrong about the end of history yes. and talked about why. So there's nothing 
better than an academic with a compelling theory, but the only thing better than that is an academic who's thought about why the theory was wrong and puts it out in public so students can learn from that experience, to be fair. The problem with the Huntington view, which is very attractive because it's black and white, good guys and bad guys, is that it's disengaged from the nuances that people like um, both of our colleagues have referenced, namely about what goes on in different societies. There are parts of Arab society that a lot of Canadians would feel very comfortable with. Well-educated, thoughtful people who, by the way, are quite religious in their Islamic faith and who respect all that. You can find that in places like Asia and Malaysia and elsewhere. So the notion that there's this bifocal battle between two great is, com is a simplistic overstatement. And by the way, it gets us out of the responsibility of sorting through the nuances so what we do is actually well modulated, measured, and constructive. I'm in radical agreement with that. And I think... <laughs> <laughs> so am I. <laughs> I think it's really important that we move away from this notion of epochal conflict and that we are inevitably drawn into some battle between the West and everybody else. That's because wrong. I think that is just so unsophisticated, ultimately, that it's going to get us into tremendous problems. And, and I think part of the, you know, you're with us or you're with the terrorists or you're with us or you're against us, that's been part of the dynamic post 9-11 that has been very problematic for Western society. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, let me just add uh, one nuance. Uh, one of the things that Western thinkers as a whole have argued, uh, really since Max Weber and going forward, is that as we became better educated and richer, religion would disappear mm -hmm. from public space. Uh, How'd and, that work out? Well, <laughs> It, didn't, it hasn't worked out very well. It hasn't worked out all that well in many of our own societies, but it certainly is not an accurate description of what is happening in much of the world. So here's again an example where I think we need to look at ourselves and say, did, did we get history right here? What about people finding meaning in religion? Um, even in the developed West where material comforts are everywhere, there is still a search for meaning, and some people find that answer in religion. So the way we think about religion as a global force, to go even beyond your point, mm -hmm. um, Stephen, we need to be open to thinking about something we collectively got entirely wrong. Religion is not disappearing. It is a powerful force in many, many societies. We will not understand these societies unless we make space for thinking about the role of religion in public life, not only not in private right. life as we think about it. And I would, I would connect that directly to human rights discourse. I think one of the yeah. great failures, especially yeah. of Northern European human rights I discourse, agree. has been an unremitting belief that there is no relationship to religion. I actually think it has disconnected human rights discourse from many societies that still I have agree. profound public religious beliefs. I agree completely. That's why I think it's actually, and I, you know, just we've had many discussions, both of us with, with people in the human rights movement, and I tend sometimes to talk about it as the Church of Human Rights, uh, because it, it, it's, it, it's so fixated on excluding any other well, church that it assumes to itself a moral rectitude that's our, blinding. Some of our African friends, Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, who've recriminalized homosexuality in a way which violates every principle yeah. of the Commonwealth of which we are all a part, by the way, and mm -hmm. should, in my view, get them kicked out of the Commonwealth until they clarify their position. You can't take they, that away from the Queen. You they, know, argue, <laughs> they argue that when we talk about human rights, it's just a new form of Western colonialism mm -hmm. imposed upon them, where I would say, actually, the right of a human being to live without fear, regardless of their sexual orientation, is actually something about which we are not prepared to negotiate. And I actually agree with you. It's, to say that one has to understand the importance of religious belief in society Absolutely. is not simply to say, and then you defer to it in all circumstances. But I think there has to be a more active engagement. And actually, as yeah. you were suggesting earlier, Hugh, finding those elements in society where you can have this conversation and try to figure out how to bolster the conversation within society. Where do those religious traditions come from you? 
in those African societies that are now banning homosexuality. Well, there are American evangelicals who yes. are going there from the West. But by the way, there is a there is a group in a wonderful group in Malaysia called the Sisters of Islam, who are yeah. lawyers and yeah. professionals who work very very hard to bridge the gap between civil law and Sharia law, in which right. more opportunity and freedom for women can be established. They're all devout. I'm yeah. proud to say the Canadian government has been supportive of their completely yeah, legitimate and legal activities. There are thousands of those organizations we should be engaging with around the world to make good things happen without huge matters of state being raised. Well, thank you all very much. I think that this discussion could go on for hours. <laughs> and I also think that it really displays the fact that the plays that we are seeing now, no matter when they are written, both Shakespearean and contemporary, there is so much that is relevant to what we're talking about. And that's what makes So you, you uh, agree theater. with me that Shakespeare was a red Tory? <laughs> 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 yes, absolutely. But he wrote better than Deepin Baker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming up with the big shepherd's crook to, uh, <laughs> uh, to, to bring them up. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, I want to thank our amazing panel, Hugh Siegel, Janice Stein, Stephen Toop, and our moderator, Deanna Horton, for conducting a fabulous exercise in disagreement without fisticuffs. <laughs> a model for the world. Um, I, also, I also need to remind you that the forum does continue all season long. We've got lots of great stuff coming up. Uh, I don't have time to mention more than one, uh, but um, uh, a week from today on Saturday, July 23rd, the Challenge of Science is being presented as well as part of our Ideas at Stratford partnership with CBC Radio. And in that event, Neil Turok, director of Perimeter Institute, will be discussing the future of scientific research with, uh, with philosopher Mark Kingwell. So that's it. Thank you all for being with us here today, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.